Welcome to Wednesday night prayer meeting and Bible study. So glad you've joined us on this rainy, cold December evening. I hope that you are a, a, a footnote to the book of Colossians. I've got my coffee cup with some water in it, and it's actually for North American Mission Board. I know it's International Mission Board time of year, as we have that emphasis, but uh, I don't have one a cup from them. I've got a cup from Nam. Maybe if the International Mission Board sends me one, I'll drink out of it. But I uh, hope you're doing well tonight. I uh, want to let you know that today is Chocolate Covered Anything Day. That's our national holiday today. National uh, Chocolate Covered Anything. So whatever you like to cover in chocolate, smother it in chocolate and eat it. I like me some chocolate covered popcorn. It's always really good. You know, when it's drizzled, you can get that stuff at Sam's. That is some good stuff. Is also Luis Cruz's birthday today. Happy birthday, Miss Louise. Send her a, she don't have a computer, she don't have Facebook, so you're just going to have to call her. And uh, uh, But it is her birthday today. Happy birthday, Miss Louise. Before I get started on anything, I would, I would like to spend some time in prayer for Mr. Terry Gold. Uh, he had to go back to the hospital uh, late this afternoon, and uh, so he's been struggling with COVID for 14 days. Uh, has already been to the hospital, spent the night one night already, and uh, so and he has just struggled every single day. So will you, if you would, let's spend some time in prayer for Mr. Terry right now. Heavenly Father, we just want to lift up Terry to you. We'll lift up his family. We'll lift up to the doctors that are taking care of him. Lord, we know he has lots of underlying issues. So Lord, we just pray for protection for him and healing for him. <coughs> Help them figure out what's going on and allow him uh, to get better and to get stronger. And we'll give you the praise for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for that. Okay, it is our International Mission Board's week of prayer and emphasis as we focus on international missions. And today we are praying for Doug Durbanshire, who serves in Thailand. And so I'm going to read to you uh, about his ministry. Doug Derbyshire goes to many places in Thailand where there are no Christians, and it troubles him deeply. But the lack of gospel witness in Banpu troubled him the most. For six years, Doug, a medical missionary with the International Mission Board, faithfully visited Banpu. He brought medical teams from the U.S. to host mobile clinics and tried every evangelism technique he knew, including knocking on countless doors. But there was still no church in Banpu, and Doug couldn't let it rest. So he pulled together another mobile medical team to take the gospel there in January of 2020. After he and other doctors would meet with their patients, a Thai Christian on Doug's clinical staff would sit down. On the first day, three people made decisions of faith. So that's pretty cool. That was just in January of this year. Uh, so three things to pray for. I pray, one, that none of the Christians would fall away from their faith. Two, that those who have yet to decide who uh, will choose to commit their lives to Christ. And pray for the formation of a healthy church in Van Poo. And we want to pray, of course, for the missionary, Doug Durbanshire. So let's pray for Doug and his work in Thailand. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this missionary that's serving on our behalf. And Lord, we pray for a church presence to be made known in this city. Lord, we thank you for that his heart is broken for this community and that he has not given up on sharing the gospel and establishing a church. Lord, bless those Christians that have made it, put their faith in you. And Lord, may their witness grow. May others join them and may a church be formed in the city. Lord, we pray for this missionary. We pray for the people of Thailand. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for praying for that for us. All right. Also, we're working through our Advent candle, or our, Ad, our Jesse tree. And this week, the, tonight, for number 16, our, I opened it up, and we have a sheep with a shepherd's staff. And this represents Jesus being the good shepherd. And actually, there's a prophecy in the book of Isaiah that actually I'm going to preach on on Sunday. In Isaiah chapter 40. And this is what it says in Isaiah chapter 40. Uh, verse 11. 
He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. <clears throat> and of course we know that Jesus is called the good shepherd. He's called the good shepherd and he calls himself the good shepherd. Uh, and so here in Isaiah, 700 years earlier, uh, it is prophesied that the Messiah would be the good shepherd. And thank the Lord that he is the good shepherd, that he cares for us, his sheep, uh, as a good shepherd. So I'll be talking about that more on Sunday morning, so make sure you tune in for that. So that is our ornament for our Jesse tree for the 16th day of December. Okay, let's get into our Bible study. We have been going through the book of Colossians, and last week I told you that at the end of the book of Colossians, after everything that Paul taught, he was going to make a huge ask. He was going to request something of the people of Colossae and that church there, and one person in particular, Philemon, he was going to ask him to, a huge, huge favor. And so for you to understand the gravity of what Paul is asking, I want to tell you a modern-day version of what took place in Paul's time. So listen to this situation. <clears throat> It'll give you insight to what Paul was dealing with. Imagine David, a trusted employee and friend of Matt and Mary, but he recently stole over $100,000 of computer hardware from the company that they worked for and he fled the state. David was not a Christian before he fled, even though Matt and Mary had witnessed to him time and time again. Matt and Mary had taken Ken, a leader in their church, out to breakfast. And after breakfast, the three of them went into Matt's office to discuss an upcoming Bible study on 1 John 1, 9 that says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When they opened the outer door after their Bible study, there they found David, seated in the waiting area. Matt quickly grabbed David by the arms and held him fast as Mary called the police, surprised that David did not resist. Matt asked David why he'd come back. David then began to share how he had spent all the money he had made uh, from the stolen hardware. But shortly after that money was gone, he then became a Christian. He felt he should return and face the consequences of his actions, even though he could not give back the money. It was clear by the way David acted and how he talked at his conversion experience that he was now a true believer. Now waiting for the police to arrive, David told Matt and Mary and Ken that he felt God wanted him to go to seminary to become a minister. The police finally arrived and took David to jail. The arresting officer informed Matt that he would need to come down to the station and formally press charges against David. Matt, Mary, and Ken uh, have gone into Matt's office to talk about David. David asked them to forgive him. But what does that mean? And how far should forgiveness be given? Because an in company insurance claim on the stolen property had been received and cashed, Matt and Mary are ob obligated to file criminal charges against David. Consequently, David could go to prison for many years for his crime. But it's clear that David's conversion experience includes a desire to go to seminary and to prepare for the ministry. What would you do? If you were Matt, Mary, and Ken, <clears throat> would you press charges? Would you forgive him of such a great debt? How would you handle that situation? Now, that seems pretty crazy, but it's very, very similar to what David, for, to what uh, Paul faced as he wrote the book of Colossians. Listen to this. This is the story that set, sets up the book of Philemon. Philemon's a very rich man living during the second century in the city of Colossae. Philemon's wealth is evident that his house is large enough to host the church of Colossae, which met in the inner courtyard or inner garden of his home. Philemon's wealth is built on slave labor, though. Slavery is quite common and is considered to be unacceptable during the air of world history. Slaves were purchased for long-term service for a duration of time that it takes to pay off uh, the slave debt through that slave labor. Slaves had no right in Roman society and were considered the lowest class. Slaves were 
not restricted to any particular culture or race. Roman law dictates that in order to preserve the structure of society, a runaway slave is considered to be a criminal and is to be severely punished up to and including execution. Now, one of Philemon's slaves by the name of Onesimus ran away from his estate, possibly stole some money, and most certainly caused a loss in revenue for Philemon. Onesimus has unexpectedly returned on his own free will, carrying with him a letter from the Apostle Paul asking Philemon to forgive Onesimus and spare his life. Now Philemon is a Christian and a respected member of the Colossian church. He is a close friend of the Apostle Paul, with whom Philemon has helped in the past with a joyful heart. Philemon's wife, Apropha, is also a Christian. As the custom of the day, Apropha is responsible for the day-to-day -day overseeing of the estate's slaves. Without slave labor, the estate could not be maintained, and the church would no longer have a place to meet. So that is the situation that Paul writes his letter to Philemon. And so now with that information, let's read the letter of Philemon together and hear Paul's argument. And hear what Paul asks of Philemon in this book. Read along with me. Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Apropha, our sister, and Acrobus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house. Grace to you, peace from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have towards the Lord Jesus for all the saints. And I pray that sharing of your faith might be become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Accordingly, though I'm not bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you, I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner also for Jesus Christ. I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I'm sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that... He might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I prefer to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be a compulsion of your own accord. For this, perhaps, is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever. No longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother, especially to me, and how much more to you, both in flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it. I say nothing of your owing me even your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I'm hoping that through your prayers, I will be graciously given to you. Ephraim, my fellow prisoner in Jesus Christ, sends his greetings to you, and so does Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. So I read the whole thing, an incredible letter, an incredible plea from Paul to Philemon. Notice in verse 4 through 7, Paul praises his service and his faithfulness. He starts by praising Philemon for all the work that he's done, all the things they've done together, all the ministry that they've done together. And he also uh, mentions that the church of uh, Colossae is meeting in his house, in Philemon's house. Then we get this plea for Onesimus, found in verses 8 through 16. He says he considers Onesimus his child. You see, Paul led Onesimus to Christ. The request 
though, that Paul has for Philemon is not that he just forgive Onesimus, but to welcome him back as a brother and an equal into the family. And then he uses this term uh, to make that plea. He says, in our partnership. The word there is the word koinonia. Koinonia is our bond as brothers and sisters in Christ. Paul is pleading. Uh, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. We, through the blood of Jesus Christ, through our forgiveness that we share because of Jesus Christ, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. And he's saying Onesimus is your brother in Christ as well. In Colossians 3.11, if you remember, he says, There is not Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is in all and is all. So even back in the book of Colossians, Paul is making this point. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what country you come from. It doesn't matter what your religious background is. It doesn't matter if you're free or slave. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. And then we see in verses 17 through 20 that Paul acts like Christ. Paul acts like Christ. He tells Philemon, act as if Onesimus is me. You know, Christ always tells us to treat others as, uh, as we're to treat others as Christ treated us. Or we are to regard other people as Christ. If we want to show love to Christ, we love on other people. Remember in Matthew, he says, uh, on the, of the least of these. When you loved on the least of these, you loved on me. When you did it to the least of these, you did it to me. And then Paul says, I'll pay for his account. I will settle up for him, much like Christ has done for us. Christ paid our account. And Paul is saying, I'll pay Onemesis. If he owes you anything, charge it to my account. And this allows them to be brothers and sisters in Christ. He also mentions Ephesus, uh, Ephes Farius, the pastor of the church, who happens to be in prison with Paul as well. Uh, and so here we see that this idea of koinonia, or the word that we use for fellowship, is not just an idea. Fellowship is not just an idea, but it works out in our relationships, especially in the church. It affects how we treat one another and how we forgive one another and how we love on one another. We are to treat each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. And we should always seek reconciliation, no matter how bad the offense might be. It is a radical transformation in how we deal with one another. We should treat how people should look at how we treat each other in the church. And they should be wowed by our forgiveness by our grace, by our patience for one another, by the forgiveness that we extend to one another. I pray that this picture that Paul paints in the book of Philemon as he writes Philemon can be described of us here at Clint Hill Baptist Church. And certainly I pray for that for your life. So just some reflection questions for you. Uh, is there someone you need to forgive? How does that this letter speak to that situation? Is there somebody you need to forgive? Second, how is this type of fellowship exhibited at Flint Hill Baptist Church? Is it? Next, how can you show this type of fellowship towards other church members? Then finally, let's pray that Flint Hill Baptist Church will be a church of true cornania. Will you pray with me for that? Dear Heavenly Father, as we are separated as a body of believers, uh, koinonia, or fellowship, becomes even more important. We are united as the body of Christ. And Lord, we pray that we will strengthen those bonds, even as we are separate, that you'll use the Holy Spirit to strengthen those bonds. May we be brothers and sisters in Christ, true brothers and sisters in Christ. May we exhibit this type of forgiveness that Paul asked for. May we exhibit this type of patience and kindness and grace towards the people around us in our church body. Lord, uh, sometimes churches enter into conflict. And Lord, I know that there's even people on our church membership that hold grief, uh, hold grudges against people, other people in this church. And it breaks my heart. Lord, I pray that all that will be vanished. All that will be 
uh, destroyed and put away, and that we will live in true fellowship as brothers and sisters in Christ here at Flint Hill Baptist Church. I pray for that for all my heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. All right, so let's go to our prayer request. Uh, we want to uh, pray for our church. Um, uh, we um, have something to celebrate as our church. We have a new church member uh, that we voted in on Sunday, and I shouldn't have even said anything because I forgot her name. <laughs> but I mentioned it uh, yesterday, and um, actually it was in your, uh, your minutes or your recommendations and your email, uh, but we're thankful that she is with us and thankful we have a new member with us today. Uh, we want to pray for, as we meet the needs of our community, uh, we want to pray for our children's ministry and pray for the lost around us. Um, and as those face sickness and face death in their families due to this pandemic, uh, our spiritual um, condition is draws a spotlight is placed on that and how important it is. So let's pray for the lost around us. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to lift up our church. Uh, we pray for the resources that we need to be about your business. We pray that we will meet the needs of our community. We pray for our children's ministry. And Lord, we pray for our number one purpose as a church, not only to worship you, but to tell others about your saving grace. So Lord, I pray that each one of us have a person that we're praying about, thinking about, and sharing the gospel with. Lord, help us have those opportunities. Help us to be bold in sharing our faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So there's recent special needs we need to lift up. We need to pray for the Blankenships. The girls were in the car by themselves. They were driving down at 160, and somebody pulled out in front of them, and they were in an accident. They were all fine. Uh, but a little shaken up, and uh, they're thankful that they weren't injured worse than they were. Uh, they're pretty much just banged up and bruised, uh, but uh, we want to remember them in our prayers. We pray for Denise Bradshaw's parents, who both have COVID and are in their 70s, and so that's always very concerning, so we pray for uh, Denise Bradshaw's parents. Pray for Marsha Kuhn, Kyle Fadley's aunt, who has rheumatoid arthritis and is losing her eyesight. Pray for my mom, Leela Deffinger, uh, dealing with chemo. She had a rough, rough weekend this past weekend, uh, but now she's through that stretch, and so she has three more treatments, and so we're just praying that uh, those treatments will not get any worse, but they tend to get worse. But we'll pray that God does a miracle there. Pray for Sarah Fadley, Kyle's mom, who's in assisted living. We need to pray for our Flint Hill family who has covid of course, the Gold family, who we prayed for earlier. We need to pray for Tom Manns. Actually, his fever finally broke after 14 days of having a fever. Uh, so we're thankful for that, but he's not out of the woods yet. Pray for Barbara and Charles Garrison. Natalie Long, our church secretary, and we found out today Isaac Robinson has tested positive as well. He's one of our newest members at the beginning of this. I think back in May, he was baptized out in the parking lot. You might remember that, uh, so pray for him. Pray for Mr. Ford, Megan Mincy's uh, grandfather, dealing with health problems. We need to pray for Eddie Groisman, Elmer and Leeds, uh, Lena Thede's granddaughter, recovering from being hit by a car. We need to pray for Harley Hammonds. He had his first treatment today, I believe, um, for his prostate cancer. And um, so pray for him. We need to pray for Ray Joy, Stephanie Fa Stephanie's father. He is still in ICU and he is not doing well and they're trying to make decisions about uh, whether to do any further surgeries or not, if that'd be beneficial, um, and trying to weigh the uh, pros and cons of that at his age and his condition. Uh, so they're having to make some difficult decisions and we just pray that God will give the doctors, Stephanie's family, discernment in making those decisions. We need to pray for Aaron Miller, Kyle and Dagmar Fadley's niece whose health is deteriorating. We need to pray for Jim Rudisill and Miss Betty Ann as she ministers to him. Uh, he's at home and having rehab come into the home, and um, she's having to attend to him quite often during the day. John Walker, Leslie Smith's son, uh, recovering from strokes, and Bobby White, who's a Thompson's family member. So lots of needs, lots of hurt, lots of people dealing with very situ 
uh, serious situations. Uh, let's pray for each of these. Will you pray with me as I lift up these names? And Father, we pray for Olivia, Abby, and Ava. Pray for Denise Bradshaw's parents, for Marsha Kuhn, Leela Deppinger, Sarah Fadley. Uh, we pray for the Gold family, Tom Manns, Barbara and Charles Garrison, Natalie, Natalie Long, Isaac Robinson. We pray for Mr. Ford, for Eddie Groisman, for Harley Hammonds, for Ray Joy, for Aaron Miller, for Jim Rudisill, for John uh, Weekler, and for Bobby White. You know each situation. You know uh, each health situation. Uh, Lord, we just pray that you be the great physician. And Lord, if you choose not to heal, we pray that you provide your comfort and your presence in each person's life. May they know your presence in a very real way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, well, that's all we have for tonight. Uh, know that uh, I have pre-recorded our, our worship for Sunday. I'm very excited about it. Uh, got to go off location again uh, to film for Sunday. And so uh, I've been working on that all week and excited about our worship experience that we'll share together on Sunday. So uh, be, in, be ready to do that. Don't forget to send in your tithes and your offerings and your offering for Lottie Moon. And uh, be praying through our prayer guide. Like I said, you can go to imb.org and pray every day for one of those missionaries. Uh, what can you give and how can you go? Pray that God will uh, help you do all three of those things. That's all I have for tonight. I uh, hope you're uh, having a great evening. If you need anything, reach out to us. I'll check in with you tomorrow about 11 o'clock, and uh, have a great evening.